I want to thank everyone for joining us. This, um, this is a really exciting period uh, for us to sit down and chat with you on a number of security uh, topics. I want to specifically start on uh, what happens once an attacker is successful. And I think this is an important way to start. I think often we, we focus too much energy on uh, what are the things that we should be doing, but we don't necessarily know what it is we're trying to achieve. So uh, a common theme you hear in my conversation, it's, uh, it's all about mindset. Before I get started, uh, talking about the impacts of a compromise, I want to kind of give a little background. So my name is Tony, as Michael just mentioned. I've been working here at Security since our early days, since our inception, um, side by side with my business partner, Daniel. Uh, and one of the biggest things we've always uh, placed emphasis on as an organization is, is understanding what the problem is and trying to address that problem. Everything we've ever done is about how do we fix the problem of websites being compromised, not for the large enterprise, not for the small businesses, but for any website owner. Uh, we don't discriminate against industry, we don't discriminate against size, we feel that website is non-discriminatory and we want to be the same way. And so some of the information I provide kind of passes over all these industries. So on behalf of Daniel and I, we're both very excited to be able to start delivering these, uh, these very hopefully valuable and actionable presentations. With that, I want to kind of set the tone a little bit for what you're going to hear. Uh, this presentation focuses on the back end or more of a bottoms up approach of saying, uh, this is what happens after a compromise. And uh, so the audience is more, you've likely been infected, you've likely experienced something that's been infected, or you're just generally curious on how you should be thinking about security and you want to take more of a proactive mindset and say, what are the things I'm trying to protect against? So uh, maybe you're curious, kind of what can an attacker do Maybe you're trying to weigh the risks, uh, trying to figure out where security fits into your overall business plan or your own online presence. And hopefully you'll get some of those answers here in this presentation. With that, whenever I talk about compromises, I always like to kind of talk a little bit about psychology of the, of the attacker or really the motivators of the attackers. Why do they hack, right? If we can sit down and take a moment to understand why they do the things they do, you can start taking away some of the personal pressures we put ourselves of why did somebody hack me? And when I do that, I always kind of break things out into kind of four distinct domains. I don't talk about the who here, I talk about the why. Because if we were talking about the who, we'd be talking about this is the demographic of this type of attacker, and this is a criminal organization, or this is a nation state. That's not necessarily what I'm saying here. What I'm saying is what motivates them. And of course, we start off with revenue, okay? So that's perhaps the easiest thing for people to understand, the ability to make money on your website. And that comes in various forms whether that's data exfiltration, which is what we've seen with things like Target and Home Depot stealing credit cards. Then the next very obvious response is, but I don't have any credit card information, but there's other ways to generate revenue from that, whether it's affiliate-based campaigns, we see that a lot in pharma hacks. Um, the bottom line is attackers have a way to make money on your website and the associated resources with that website. And so of course, there's enough motivation. And what we've learned over time is that with enough motivation, with enough, um, time, anything can be penetrated. And if you make yourself a, a susceptible target, you will get penetrated. Then we move into the audience. This is kind of for that audience or the, that target market that says, well, I don't necessarily have anything of value. But what we forget is that you do have something of value. Every one of us that have an online presence has what we call audience. We have people that come to our website, um, read our articles, maybe they purchase our products or services, and that audience is uh, valuable. That audience allows them to generate revenue for some form or another. But also, um, it allows them to be engaged, not just from you as a website owner, but from the attacker's perspective. Maybe I want to target them and I want to distribute some form of desktop malware. Maybe I want to encrypt their environment. Maybe I want to download some kind of Trojan in their environment and steal their financial data. Um, it's not just about what they see on your website, but what your website can do to your audience. Second, thirdly, we have resources. Um, I have found that when talking to website owners, we think very one-dimensionally. We think, uh, okay, I'm running WordPress, I am running Joomla, and that's all I care about. But in fact, we have a responsibility to the environment as a whole in which that website resides. Uh, things like their server. And that server is very valuable because that server has other components on that server, whether it, maybe you're using it as a mail server, maybe you're using it as a file server or, or some other uh, server of some type that can be abused, uh, whether it's to send out email spam, uh, maybe it's used and integrated into a larger network, otherwise known as botnets. Um, or maybe it's used to attack other websites so that the attacker can use your resources and they never get in trouble. But then you, in turn, get affected uh, because of their nefarious acts. Uh, so we have to think, once we are online, we're, much, we're part of a much larger ecosystem and our responsibilities ex extend beyond the website itself. 
And lastly, and perhaps um, the most annoying of the motivators is just, why not, right? Um, maybe I graduated high school, uh, my mom's working, I, my mom and dad are working, I'm sitting at home and I have nothing better to do. Um, I saw this awesome webinar from Security talking about websites getting hacked and now I'm curious how websites get hacked. They go online, they find a little script, uh, and oh my gosh, look, via some Google dorks, I'm able to identify somebody running an outdated version of some open source CMS or closed source CMS, whatever it may be, um, and boom, I'm in. Uh, and so now it's a matter of telling my friends, look what I did, look how awesome I am, look at me, I'm the lead. Um, and that happens all the time, right? Uh, and unfortunately, it's perhaps the most frustrating thing because what's going through their mind is simply doing something for fun or amusement with little consideration into the impacts that that may have to you as a website owner, um, whether that's affecting your ability to support your family or support your business or support your employees, whatever the case may be. Um, and the last thing we want is to get affected because of something like that. And some of the impacts can be severe on the low side because on the low side, they have no motivation of, of revenue or audience, so they could easily log into your environment and delete your entire directory. And those with an improper security posture, no backups, no maintenance, um, often find themselves uh, on, the, on the bad side of a short stick. So we understand the motivators. We understand that uh, they may want to uh, log in and, and, and uh, abuse our environment, and they may have motivations to do that. Uh, but what exactly can they do? And when I talk about this, um, I always like to start and say, let's remember that when we're working with infections, what we see is only what the attacker wants us to see. Um, and in often cases, we, it, it's actually a much more complicated problem. And what you see is only a fraction of the problem. Often, similar to an iceberg, a lot of the problems reside in the things that you cannot see. So if I log to a site and I see that it's distributing some kind of malware, that's great. Uh, but we need to be thinking beyond that. I say, okay, if they have, if they're distributing malware and it's part of a larger network, um, the odds are is that they have other things in that environment that are going to ensure that they can continue to access that environment. Things like back doors or maybe they've added this environment to their larger network so maybe we need to be looking for any other server level scripts that uh, might allow them to do that may allow them to not only distribute malware via your site or do some kind of spam campaign but also uh, allow it to attack other sites part of a larger network so we want to be looking at the things that we see as well as the things that we don't see with that in mind i always like to break things out infection types and i look at seven distinct infection types now these are not mutually exclusive. So just because you have malware distribution doesn't necessarily mean you won't have search engine poisoning or you won't have phishing or phishing loads. In fact, um, what we see a lot is uh, once an environment has been penetrated, you can actually expect to see probably a little bit of everything. Uh, they kind of just uh, open up Pandora's box and they're like, awesome, I have access, and they kind of just dump it in your website. And they're like, sweet, let's see what works. Uh, obviously, that's not always the case, but that is often um, the case. And when we look at the relationship between the types of infections and the motivations, this is kind of what we look at. So when I talk about malware distribution, what I'm talking about is really the distribution of, um, of drive-by download, or excuse me, it's more drive-by download attempts. Uh, for instance, and what we've heard of that is uh, you open a website and unbeknownst to you, the website pops up a little dialogue in your uh, desktop and it says, uh, please clean your PC or your antivirus is out of date, click here to update a lot of individuals won't make the relationship between the activity that's happening on the desktop and the activity that's happening on their website and understand that the trigger is actually happening from the website. They simply see it as a desktop, they're like, oh, okay, perfect, and they click on it. And they don't believe it to be the website because they trust that website. Then you have things like search engine poisoning. As the name implies, it's, it's the method in which attackers are able to um, abuse how search engines view and interact with your site. So maybe they go to Perez box and they pull up Perez box and I like to talk about business and security, but instead um, you go to Google and you find that I'm actually talking about Viagra and Cialis and maybe I'm selling you the latest Gucci bags. Um, and that's obviously not a good thing. Then we have phishing lures. Phishing lures is where we use um, a website of say of a known environment, say uh, your Facebook or your PayPal or your Wells Fargo, and we try to trick you into giving us some sensitive information, whether that's credit card information, whether that's your login credentials, whatever that may be. So say you get an email from Wells Fargo, um, it says, you know, please, this is uh, your 90 day uh, username and password check. We need you to log in and uh, provide us with your, uh, update your password. And so you go through the process, you click on the link because it says Wells Fargo home and you click on it, it goes to your browser, we open it and it says, okay, username, password, update the whole nine yards, you know, oh, and we need you to confirm your address 
and your mother's maiden name and your birth date and your favorite pet and the, the rest is history. And then all that information gets captured and it gets sent back to what's known as a command and control environment. And then that happens to thousands and thousands of people. Now, how horrible would we feel if that's being facilitated through our websites? And it happens every day. It gets embedded in, in very discrete in, uh, locations on your server, and then it's added to email campaigns, and it's kind of all interrelated. We have things like spam email, where your servers are, are distributing this spam on a continuous basis, maybe part of marketing campaigns. And this ensures that the attackers can continue to do this at scale without, being, without their campaigns being affected. We shut off one server, that's okay, because I have 10 more servers part of my network. We have things like defacements, um, and that's simply you log into an environment, next thing you know, you're, you're pro ISIS or you're pro, you're, you're pro some activity that you're against or whatever the case may be, uh, especially a lot of Israeli uh, pa uh, Palestinian um, activities, you'll see a lot of that pop up. Oh, we're pro Palestinian, we're pro Israeli, whatever the case may be. Um, it's all about a lot of hacktivism, a lot of uh, pursuing other activities, things like that. DDoS scripts and backdoors. I briefly talked on that, and that's where the attackers are able to implement uh, scripts at the server level that look to abuse uh, the resources. So uh, the backdoors look to abuse your access control. Maybe you're using WordPress and you have two-factor authentication and you have IP whitelisting, et cetera, on WP admin. But now through a backdoor, the attacker is able to bypass all those controls and simply access the environment without, access, uh, without going the normal um, avenue that you've defined. Bot scripts being part of larger botnets or even DDoS or distributed denial of service attacks, being able to use your environment to attack other environments or being part of a larger network. Of course, there's ransomware as well. That's something that's been coming uh, to the forefront as of late, which is uh, twofold, right? They can log into your environment and they can uh, hold your website hostage. They encrypt your entire directory. And if you don't have a backup, now you find yourself in a situation where the only way to decrypt that information is to either pay the attackers in Bitcoin or, uh, or have to rebuild the entire website. And it just kind of depends on what your preference is. Um, data exfiltration is kind of what we often hear about in large, in large scale, 60 million credit cards stolen from Target, uh, 20 million stolen from Home Depot, whatever the case is. But that actually happens at smaller scales as well. And it doesn't necessarily always happen in large scale. It can happen um, with small businesses with just a few hundred customers. Um, data extends beyond credit cards and goes into uh, information like personal identifiable information, and I'll talk about that. So this is just kind of a very, very high rudimentary explanation of some of the types. Again, this is not an exhaustive list, but this is perhaps uh, the top seven that we see affecting uh, websites of all sizes, large organizations, small organizations, blogs. Um, so with that understanding, I like to think of the impacts, and I think when I think of impacts, I like to break them out into two distinct domains. I look at it from a business perspective, how does it affect me? And then from a technical perspective, how does it affect me there? And I think that's really important because each, every one of us has a little bit of different perspective. On the business, I'm concerned about one thing, but on the technical side, I need to know how to address that. So we'll, we'll approach it from that perspective. When we think about the business impacts, first and foremost is obviously the brand. We if we have an online presence, I, I really don't care if it's a blog, if it's a static page, if it's a commerce site, whatever it is, uh, it was built and deployed for a reason. Whether Even if it was only to target 100 people, we, we still focused on building some kind of brand. Um, and we have some responsibility to that brand, not just to ourselves, but to our audience. And one of the things that we've learned is that uh, no matter how much someone says that, oh, that website is of no value to us, um, they quickly find out how valuable it is when all of a sudden, even the 100 people that were going to it are no longer going to it, right? Um, and uh, that's, that's really, it's, it's critical to the reputation of that brand. Now, the one thing we have noticed, however, is that unlike 2010, 2011, uh, the tolerance is evolving. There seems to be more tolerance to uh, compromises of some kind as long as, as we as businesses uh, work to articulate that problem to our audience, explain to them what has happened, um, and you see, you usually, you often seem to recover. It takes a little bit of time, and so it really comes down to you. Are you willing to accept this as a risk? Are you willing to have your brand potentially tarnished, and are you okay with an impact for, say, 48 hours, three weeks, a month, whatever that may be? And only you can really define that. Of course, that leads us into the economic impacts. This is perhaps the most obvious, right? Uh, if we get uh, blacklisted or, or, or someone is unable to access the environment or uh, your audience loses faith in what you're providing them, then you don't generate uh, new traffic. You don't have any net new uh, growth. 
Uh, maybe nobody's purchasing purchasing um, your products or your services. And of course, there's an economic impact there. But I want you to think beyond that impact, beyond the ability to generate revenue, but also think about what you spend, right? And your spend isn't necessarily always monetary. A good percentage of it is, but it's also your time. How much time are you willing to invest to get back up? Is it something that you should be doing or is it something that you want to be focusing on the business? Um, and then how are you going to feel moving forward? Um, what software and technologies and personnel and training do you need to invest in uh, post-compromise to try to ensure that doesn't happen again? And are you okay with that happening again? And of course, there's going to be um, financial implications of that as well. Lastly, the one thing I, 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 I want to emphasize is the emotional distress. Um, this probably isn't discussed as often, but it's actually really important. Over the years, I've had a lot of conversations with customers, and I've had customers crying on the phone saying, I cannot believe this happened. And there's, there's a tremendous amount of anxiety. Um, at that point, when a compromise happens, I can tell you right now that nothing will ever move fast enough. Um, God, this stupid host doesn't know what's happening, right? Oh, these security guys, they're lost. They don't know what's going on. I could have done that myself. You know, I can't believe this. It takes so long. It's been 45 minutes and someone's responded to me. Um, for you, it's, it's, it can feel like the end of the world. And it's a, it's a combination of not knowing what's happening and just pure frustration and anxiety to the problem. Um, of course, there's also confusion. What do I do now? Okay, so Google blacklisted me. Who do I talk to? You know, I go to my host and my host says, I'm only responsible for the network. I'm not responsible for your website. And like, I cannot believe that, right? Why wasn't that in, the, why wasn't that in large print? Um, things like that. And then that leads to a lot of anger, right? Now you're mad, you're upset. I cannot believe you just want to reach through the matrix and shake somebody and be like, why would you have done this to me? Do you not know uh, that my website's so important to me, right? And I can tell you right now that hacks almost always happen at uh, the most critical point. You're about to launch your latest post. You're about to uh, push the latest product, right? You're about to have a thousand visitors to your site, you know, in, in, in 25 minutes. And it's just crazy stuff. And now, of course, it'll happen at that moment. Um, and then you go through this phase of like sadness, just of despair. We work with customers and it's like, we've been working this for three weeks. We don't know what's happening. We're, we're, we're just so infuriated. And we're so mad and sad. It's, you know, it's just, it's ruined. You haven't been eating for days, uh, things like that. And then you, you go through this phase of just distrust, right? Um, why would I give anybody access to my environment again? You know, how do I even know what plugins to use or what extensions to leverage? You know, how do I know that this is a good host? And you start asking yourself all these whys and never really find um, the answers. And that, that leads to what I like to call kind of an erosion of trust uh, in technology and internet and people. And it just leads for a very bad um, feeling. When we move into the technical uh, impacts, there are obviously a lot of technical impacts. Um, first and foremost that I like to start with is kind of website blacklisting. This is perhaps uh, the ones that can affect you the biggest because it's uh, or the most and that's because what that means is that somebody has the ability to stop people from accessing your environment um, and it extends beyond search engines. So yes, Google, Bing and a couple other search engines will make it so that when somebody goes to your website and if it's been infected, they will actually uh, kill anybody's ability to access it. Uh, and it'll show them a big red screen. This, this site may be distributing malware, maybe have issues. You may not want to go to this site. And that can be very devastating for, for a website owner and it can actually kill uh, all the engagement with that traffic. Um, but it also extends to your IP. It extends to your domain with mail servers. And it extends to like network firewalls, say like the web sensors of the world where they, if you get categorized for pornography, all of a sudden, uh, somebody from a specific network won't be able to access it. And that can extend to AT&T provider or, or your cell providers. That can extend to uh, airport providers, the whole nine yards. So we want to be careful of that. Of course, there's the SEO impact. This kind of goes without saying. Um, an attacker can go and attack your search engine result pages. They can attack your SEO. And from a marketing perspective, from a business perspective, that can be a nightmare. But from a technical perspective, it can also be a nightmare. Because what we know is once things are in your analytics, it takes a very long time to clear that up. Uh, it dirties your analytics. You have to try to decipher the information. Is that legitimate or is it not? Um, and then, of course, what are the impacts to my search engines? Maybe I go from a ranking of one, and now I'm a ranking of 15. And one of the things that, that we know is that you know the search engines are really fast to take away ranking, but they're really slow to give it back. So we want to be conscious of that. Lastly is the compromise to our visitors. You know, I personally have, uh, I feel a huge responsibility for anybody that may go to my web properties. And I would hope that everybody, uh, at least that's attending this webinar, feels the same way, right? Um, 
talking to brand and reputation and trust, it, I feel that when somebody comes to one of our properties, uh, it's our responsibility to ensure that we're providing them a safe and secure environment, right? And that's part of our contributions to the internet as a whole. And I think we should all be doing that because I think that uh, the last thing I want is uh, my mom visiting one of my websites and then my mom calling me the next day and saying, you know, Tony, you know what's really weird? I logged into my bank and now all of my life savings is gone. And to know that my site could have had a contributing factor to that uh, would just be devastating. And I think we all need to be thinking in that in that kind of mindset as well. It's like, who, who are we okay with somebody calling us and saying they cannot log into their environment anymore because they've been hacked or uh, they no longer have their finances because uh, they were hacked because of something that our website distributed? That would be devastating. The same way that we would feel devastated if credit card information was stolen. So with that in mind, I want to take a few minutes to kind of uh, broach the subject of website security and how to think about it. I don't necessarily want to tell you what to do because there's a lot of information on that, but I think that security always starts with good posture and uh, the right mindset. And so when we talk about security, I want you to think of one very important facet, which is security is not a static state. And I think this is perhaps one of the biggest mistakes we do as website owners or just people in IT in general, which is, if I find this technology, if I find this person, if I find this process, it'll stop the it'll stop the entire process. It's not. It's a continuous process that you're constantly evolving. The attacks don't just say, "Oh, they're blocking this. I'm okay now. Let me just walk away, and you'll be good." When in reality, we need to be looking at a process that includes different facets. How are we protecting our environment? How are we detecting in the event our protection fails? But also, do we have a, a response protocol in the event something terrible goes wrong? Who do I touch base with? Who do I talk to? Who's going to be there to help me? Then, then, of course, what kind of maintenance am I doing in the environment, right? What kind of administration, updates, backups? How am I monitoring and, and providing visibility to what's occurring in the environment? Because all those are huge uh, assets to providing us good indicators of compromise or potential compromise. And then, of course, lastly, is our best practices and principles, right? Um, things like defense and depth, very similar to the things, the processes that I just discussed now, and even principles like. Uh, least privileged access and, and things like that. The last thing I want to touch on is uh, technology will never replace our responsibility of website owners. And I think this is really important because I see this across all the various communities that I work in is this desire to find the silver bullet, right? Um, if I find this right plugin, if I find this right configuration, all this will stop. But in reality, that this is what the world looks like. Security was never designed just around the people or just around the process or just around the technology. Instead, it's a symbiotic relationship between the three components, right? Uh, technology in it by itself is of no value if the people aren't there to configure it correctly. We see this all the time in IT, right? Where uh, they take a firewall, they deploy the firewall, and they're saying, I'm secure, I have a firewall. But then they look at the configuration and they have allow all. And it's like, all you did was put hardware right in between the attacker and you, and you spent a lot of money doing it, and it's doing absolutely nothing for you, right? It's when the people come in, they analyze your traffic, they understand what's good, what's bad, they do the configurations, they block out the right ports. That in itself is what's going to help you. It's not the default settings. And then, of course, having a process of maintenance, going through the process, updating it, monitoring. I log in every morning, and I look at my logs, and I say, who's logged in? Right? I don't have a lot of people logging into my site. So I know that if somebody from China at 2 a.m. logs into my environment using my credentials, that's obviously a problem. Right, That's not acceptable. Obviously, I have to look into see what's happening because they may have not uh, done anything in the environment at the time. They just simply verify that they can log in. So we want to think about this. It's people, process, and technology. Those are the things that give us a very good security posture. And then, of course, lastly, um, my personal opinion and our opinion is that security is not a uh, do-it-yourself project. It never has been and it shouldn't be. Just because uh, the platforms we leverage may be DIY doesn't mean every facet of that platform of how we build websites is DIY. Uh, so with that, uh, again, I want to thank you for joining me here at Security. And here at Security, we build uh, a comprehensive uh, security stack for websites uh, designed for uh, business owners that want to get back to uh, or website owners that just want to get back to doing what they do, whether that's running a business, whether that's marketing, whether that's sales. Uh, I can tell you for a fact that nobody really likes security. Um, only a really select few do, and we should let those people focus on it and let us get back to doing our business. So in our in our approach, we, we have a hybrid relationship where we focus on protection, detection, and response um, for the website owner, uh, but we also work with the website owners to help improve their overall maintenance, their overall best practices, and we try to give that guidance. So if there's anything we can do to help, 
please let us know, contact our team, and we'll be more than happy to uh, engage. With that, I will turn it back over to you, Michael, and maybe we can open up the Q&As. Absolutely, Tony. Can everyone uh, hear me all right? I believe so. Great. All right. Well, Tony, we have some really good questions that came in uh, while you were doing your presentation, and even some are still coming in now. I want to start out with um, this question here. I thought that it was a very pertinent uh, question, and it says, our site was... Um, Hold on real quick. I just want to make sure that I have the right one. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Uh, it says that our site was developed with quite a bit of custom coding, plugins, WordPress, which break upon WordPress updates unless manually patched, which can be time consuming. Absolutely. Right. How can we protect our site between WordPress security alerts, releases, and the time it takes our web development to apply those patches on custom code and plugins? Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a really good question. Um, this is actually something that we ran into many years ago uh, when working with customers, and we found that that to be a very big problem. Um, we found that there's a huge delta in between the time that uh, an update goes out and the time that we can actually replace it. So one of the things that we, we did here was we developed uh, what's known as a, a protection platform that's essentially a web application firewall or an intrusion prevention system. And what that is is a, uh, it's a layer of defense that sits beyond the application layer and sits at what we call the edge or in between uh, your audience and your website. What that allows us to do is uh, what's known as virtual hardening and patching. We are, we're able to uh, patch and uh, mitigate attacks at the edge before they ever hit your environment. So in an environment like this where you have a very stringent process or maybe it's entirely custom and you're unable to update and apply configuration changes, uh, I, I would recommend looking into things like a web application firewall or an intrusion prevention system. Um, and if, if you're a DIY type of guy and you want to do it yourself, then I would recommend things like uh, Mod Security, which is an open source solution as well, um, where you wouldn't have to pay for it, but it would require time on your part. You'd have to configure it. You'd have to look at things like, okay, what are the potential for a remote file inclusion attack or a remote code execution attack or a cross-site scripting attack, and you'll have to write those rules. Or you can use a SaaS-based approach to that, which is what we've built, and, and I would recommend for something like that. Excellent. Thank you, Tony. Um, another question. Uh, is WordPress the most vulnerable CMS versus Joomla or Drupal? No, I think, you know, I always think that's a very silly question, right? Um, I think that uh, that kind of, that question doesn't account uh, for how technology is. And I, one of the things I mentioned is, and I don't blame the, the, whoever asked that, is it's not their fault. It's something that I see in the industry a lot. WordPress is, it's like saying Microsoft is, is worse than Apple, but it's just, it's apples and oranges, right? It's different environments. Um, WordPress is the largest platform in the world right now for website uh, CMSs, right? Dominating, what, 26% of the market? It's only fair that more energy would be invested to identify weaknesses in that environment. But understand, though, that uh, rarely is it a problem of the core of the application. Uh, more often than not, the problem we find is in the extensibility of the platform or in things like plugins and themes. What that tells you is that um, WordPress is so big and so valuable that a lot of people are spending energy to find ways to penetrate that environment. And they're doing that through the extensible components of that environment, plugins, extensions. And that holds true for all platforms, whether it's Joomla, Drupal, whatever the case may be. Um, so it's not necessarily a platform thing. It's not that WordPress is more vulnerable than Joomla or Drupal. It's not necessarily true. They all have their own vulnerabilities. They all have their own issues. Some are larger than others. And so some are bigger targets. And there's better tools for them just because people have invested more time in penetrating those environments. Uh, good. Um, next question. Is there a way to have the quality of my website code audited to know more about vulnerability or the ease of fixing my site? Yeah, you know, there is. There, there are ways that you can do either dynamic analysis or static analysis to the environment uh, or to the code. And I often tell folks that unless you have a team dedicated that understands one development, two, secure development, 
um, to be very cautious of this, right? Because it can be very overwhelming. Say you go get the latest scanner and you deploy the scanner. It's gonna, it could potentially, without tuning, generate a lot of what we call false positives. And you'll spend half your day pulling your hair out or looking like this, trying to figure out, make sense of what's happening. Oh, what does that mean? Or what's an object injection? Or what does it mean here? What does it mean there? Um, the other thing too is that it's not just a matter of um, looking at the code. If you look at a lot of the vulnerabilities that we've released, um, our research team has, uh, it's it's about how you think as a breaker, right? A builder and a breaker are fundamentally different in terms of psychology and how they approach problems. And if you look, it's it's often, yes, there could be vulnerabilities in the code itself. Maybe you didn't sanitize an input or sanitize an output or, or whatever the case may be, but um, it's how you interrelate things. So I find a bug over here. Maybe I find a bug in the server. I find a bug in this code. I find a bug over here in this theme, and I interrelate all those bugs together to create one big vulnerability for the environment. So what I always tell folks is, while you can leverage vulnerability scanners and they can do various types of analysis to give you feedback, um, be cautious, right? Unless you have a team that's knowledgeable and is able to help you, um, I'd be very, very cautious of that, uh, of, the, of the feedback you get, or you can kind of go down a rabbit hole. So seek professional help. Awesome. Um, here we go. Why isn't it possible to build an antivirus, anti-malware software to protect the website similar to what is done for local environments, i.e. Windows? Will this happen in the future? So it's a, it's a very interesting question. It's actually a, a subject that um, my partner and I, Daniel, discuss frequently, right? You know, could we ever build something that functions similar to an endpoint, but uh, endpoint security, which is what you're describing. Um, there's a couple of things to note on that, right? If there was one solution or one AV that could do it all, we wouldn't have the plethora of desktop AVs that exist between the McAfee's and the Norton's and the AVG's and the AVS and the Malwarebytes and the ESC, ESATs, right? Everybody does it a little bit different. Nobody's 100%. Everybody just, their approach is good to some extent, right? Um, Unlike the desktop, websites are fundamentally different, right? Um, we're not working with DLL or objects in the environment. We're working with the actual injection of code in files. So, for instance, uh, maybe I'll look at your functions PHP file, and in the functions PHP file at the header, uh, or on your header file, functions PHP file, and in it, I'll find some injection that's been embedded within other functions. Uh, and so, analysts have to go in and remove that. So even when you hear website security providers now that say, oh, we have an automated process, or we have a smart process of identifying, and it's fully automated, it's actually BS, right? Because there are instances of infections where you can remove it 100%, but a good percentage of the time, you are unable to. Because SEO spam, for instance, um, SEO spam is a perfect example. SEO spam is embedded right in the text. So maybe you open up a post or an article, depending on what CMS you're using, and they go in and they'll add it every other word. They'll add Viagra, Cialis, right? And, and it's, there's no rhyme or reason to that. You have to go through, identify that, remove that SEO spam, things like that. A lot of malware distribution. For instance, look at the latest iframe ad, um, adware injection that uh, Dennis wrote about, right? Where uh, it was injected in every JavaScript file on your server. Um, if we remove it and we quarantine that file, the whole server would break. In some instances, removing it does break it as well, but we can't just quarantine those environments the way endpoints work. It's just a fundamentally different environment. Do I anticipate something like that ever happening? Um, I, I don't think so. I mean, my, my partner and I are of the opinion that the key to good website security is a good hybrid between human intelligence and artificial intelligence or technology, right? We mash the two together. They facilitate, right? Security has never been about one or the other. It's been about people, process, and technology. And that's how we built our tools. And I think that's how we'll continue to build them. And we think that that's the best approach, right? When people get their websites hacked, they want to work with humans. They don't want to work with bots. And there's a reason for that. Nice. Um, this question has come in a couple of times, so I want to pose this one to you, uh, Tony. Um, are there any particular plugins that we should stay away from? Um, it's hard to say, right? Um, right. That's a you know that's an interesting question. That, it's come, it depends. It's come up it, depends times. it depends what you're trying to what, what what the issue is and what your configuration is. I, I would flip that around, and I would say. Um, I would leverage only the plugins that I require for my website to function, right? And I think that the reason I say that is because 
um, too often we log into an environment and we'll find 150, 200 different plugins in that environment or extensions or modules or whatever it is that you're using. And then it comes to find out that maybe we forgot that the plugin was there. Maybe we don't leverage that plugin anymore, things like that. It's not necessarily the ones you should stay away from as much as it is uh, you should be more aware of what you're using. Uh, the one thing that I could say around that is uh, be very aware of uh, free plugins uh, that are not in a recognizable like repository. Even though things like uh, the CMS repositories are not always 100% and there are ways to bypass that, it's still uh, a better environment to pull your free from than say going to Google and saying free uh, security plugin or free whatever the, 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 the request might be. Uh, and if you are going to use free, then make sure you go to uh, a reputable source or make sure that domain exists, make sure that the author's um, active in the community, that he's sharing stuff, that you can get a hold of them. Because the last thing you want to do is uh, I download a pirated piece of software that comes in, uh, it's fully functional, uh, and uh, but comes with some kind of backdoor. Uh, especially if uh, you're looking for a plugin, all you find are premium plugins, and all of a sudden one day you find that same premium plugin for free, uh, that should be a red flag because no one's just going to do that out of the goodness of their heart. They're not going to just take a pre premium plugin, buy it, and then give it to the world for free with no with no return of some kind. Right. That makes sense. Um, just a couple more questions. We'll take a couple more questions. Uh, Tony, I have this one uh, for you. It's from an anonymous viewer, actually, and he says one of us. Yeah, right? This one says one of our websites got hacked in two days after it was released and made public. Mm -hmm. No person or any search engines knew the website existed, knew the URL. How did that happen? Yeah, so this is a really interesting question, right? Um, I've done some tests in the past personally in my own honeypots, and, I, and I've seen them happen anywhere between 15 to 30 days. Uh, two days doesn't surprise me. Um, in one of our future um, webinars, we'll be talking about how hacks happen. Or, uh, and in that, what I'll talk a lot about is automation. Um, the odds are perhaps either the, uh, the IP was flagged and just continuously crawling that flag to see that IP to see what domain pops up in that domain, that IP, and then the minute it popped up, they, they, they were able to identify it. It's, it's really hard to speculate, obviously, without more information. Uh, the server could have been compromised prior. Um, the IP could have been compromised prior. Uh, it's just really, really hard. Without knowing the details, um, it's difficult to, like I said, speculate. But in the future, I'll be talking about how, and maybe we'll be able to answer it at that point, or at least give you some better ideas of, of what to do. What I can say is um, one very good way to uh, investigate or do some forensics is to maybe go on that server and identify, obviously, make sure there's no rootkits. You can use things like OSEC, which is an open source host intrusion detection system. Um, or you could actually just go through the logs yourself and see if you can identify the point of entry or the attack vector and see maybe that will answer some questions for you. Good. And uh, this question, I think this is really nice. Uh, uh, for our final question, I think this one is really good. Tony, uh -huh. how can a mere mortal ever get on top of all of this? <laughs> yeah, so uh, the good thing is that there are organizations like Sukuri, right? Uh, guys like myself and Michael and Daniel and the rest of the team that we live and breathe this stuff, right? Um, I, over the years, there used to be a time where I thought that with enough knowledge and education, we could get people to care as much as we care about it. Uh, but that'd be like trying to convince me to care about cars, right? I just don't. I just take it to the mechanic because if I did it, my wife would get mad at me, the car would stop working a block down the road, right? Uh, so fortunately, there are services like ours that we invest a tremendous amount of energy both in education and, and research. Um, and it's actually one of the reasons that uh, you'll find if you look online, um, we've been sharing information and things that we've been learning around how hacks work and the things to be concerned about for many years. It is at the core of who we are, at the core of what we do. I mean, just look at today's blog article by Peter Kankowski. He wrote a great article talking about TLS and being mindful of that and how it works. Just earlier this week, we talked about how um, websites were being compromised and uh, links to docs and PDFs were being used to, to um, alter your SEO and potentially impact it and redirect to porn sites, right? This is the kind of stuff you only find here, and that comes from um, our commitment to security and the research that we do. So to answer to your question, the way mere modals um, keep up with stuff like this is by entrusting organizations like mine um, where this is what we do. We live and breathe it. We love it. Uh, and uh, this is where you come to, right? So you can get back to doing your business. Thank you, Tony. 
Um, and thank you again to everyone. I know that we had a ton of questions. Uh, we still had several really, really awesome questions. And like I said at the opening, we're going to get our team together and come back and get some comprehensive answers to all of you. Um, several of you noted some concerns and, and wanted to find out a little bit more information about certain products and all of that. We're going to address every single issue, guys. We're going to uh, pull this script and make sure that we address it all. Um, at this time, I'm going to share the results from our poll earlier. Uh, so that you guys can see those demographics. Thank you again for participating in uh, Sakuri's very first webinar. We really appreciate your attendance. We're going to let you guys know, because uh, this is one of the questions that was asked, we'll let you guys know via email uh, when the next scheduled webinar will be. But we're definitely, definitely doing this again. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you, guys. Take care. Bye.